chiropractor here in Frankfurt, Illinois. Um, and I wanted to start by thanking you for taking time out of your schedule. It's a holiday season. And I know that you could be at Christmas parties and dinners and out with friends and things like that. And I appreciate you taking time to come here tonight. And I also, um, well, you know that I'm not here to sell you anything. If you never become a patient in this office, that's fantastic. But if you can take this information home and give it to a friend or a family member and it changes their life, to me, it's worth my while. I'm really hoping to just educate the community. Um, I come from a family of teachers and preachers, so I guess it just runs in the family. So let's start with your very tired thyroid. How many people in the morning wake up and jump out of bed? Anybody? Unless you have to. Unless you have to. <laughs> Uh, are you wide awake and ready for your day? I have tons of energy. Like my nephews, when they were small, and they were just really kind of, could, you, you could just bottle that energy, it would be fantastic. Or maybe this is you, more like Charlie Brown. I go to bed tonight, I'm already tired for tomorrow. Um, actually, a lot of our clients and our patients feel more like they relate to Charlie Brown than, than the other one. So. The thing is that a lot of our customers, a lot of our patients have come to us and they've said that they've gone to other doctors to try to figure out what's wrong. And maybe they've had conversations with their medical doctors and said, all right, well, let's run some tests. And their tests come back normal. And yet the person is sitting in front of them and feels like crud, you know. Um, sometimes when they ask questions and want to dig deeper, it's like their doctor just wants to scurry them out because there's nothing more that they can or want to do. In fact, we've had, what, two patients in the last week or two mm -hmm. with nutritional appointments. That very same conversation happened. Doc, I've had this blood test, I've had that blood test, everything's normal. I'm like, well, if it was normal, you wouldn't be sitting in my office, right? And they're like, well, yeah, I'm looking for something deeper. There's something else going on. And unfortunately, I actually have a, a mentor of mine. He's a medical doctor out of Detroit, Michigan, West Bloomfield Hills. Excellent guy when it comes to thyroid. And he even admits in his seminars that when he was trained in medical school, they were taught to run a very brief amount of tests with the thyroid. If nothing was wrong, then to move them on. Tell them there's nothing wrong with them. Or give them an antidepressant. Or, well, I hate this one, but tell them it's in your head. That one doesn't go over too well. But tell me what, you know, are, <coughs> does anyone know what the thyroid does? I went ahead and gave the answer. I didn't see it. <laughs> you didn't see it? Okay, good. What does the thyroid do? Can anybody tell me that? It regulates something. <laughs> Regulate, you're, on, you're halfway there? You're halfway it there? It regulates yeah. a hormone or something? You're on the right yeah. track. Okay. What were you going to say? I'm sorry? Metabolism. metabolism. Metabolism? What do you think? I was going to say metabolism. So. Three for metabolism. All right, good. Well, you're on the right track. I gave you the answer. It does regulate our metabolism. It's like a little engine in our cells. It's like your car. Mm -hmm. And when that engine warms up, we can get heat, so it's nice and comfortable in our Chicago winters. It also helps regulate the heart and the cardiovascular system, our digestive system, muscle control, and our brain development. It even helps our mood, and as well as bone maintenance. And, and we've got a group of ladies here. When we get to our 40s, our 50s, and our 60s, we're concerned about our bone strength. All of which depend, and the thyroid depends on a good source of diet, um, good source of iodine in our diet. So I got a little crazy with the cartoons, so think of the thyroid hormone as a little car. I'm not sure if that's a Volkswagen or what, but it's a cool little car. The thyroid does not work independent by itself. It doesn't just do its own thing. It's actually part of a system. I like to use the chain of command from the military. No one in the military works on their own accord. There's always somebody above them who tells them what to do. The general is one who takes the orders, or excuse me, I guess he answers to the president, wouldn't he? <laughs> um, but he's kind of the chief guy in the military. He gives orders to the colonel. The colonel gives orders to the major, down to a captain, down to a lieutenant, down to the, the soldiers down beneath. There's always somebody above that gives orders and nobody works independently. Your endocrine system is exactly the same way. The hypothalamus is in the brain, which gives signals to the pituitary by releasing thyroid releasing hormone. The pituitary, which you've probably heard of, gives <clears throat> releases thyroid stimulating hormone to the thyroid, which then produces T4 and T3 hormones that go to the rest of the body. 
And that's, those are the soldiers. Those are the cells and the, the guts, the muscles, the lungs, all the other tissues that get their orders from the thyroid hormone. Okay? One other housekeeping issue is if you have any question, raise your hand and we'll address it right away. You don't have to wait till the end. I had a high school teacher who said, if you have a question in mind, your ears stop working. And what he meant by that was when the teacher says something you have a question about, your ears stop and your brain stops until that question gets answered. So raise your hand if I don't make sense. So what is, I'm sorry, uh, the pituitary, uh, I've heard a lot about the pituitary gland. Mm -hmm. So if that's messed up, would it mess up your thyroid? Absolutely, because it trickles down, just like the chain of command. If the pituitary is messed up, it's going to affect the thyroid and everything else. As well as if there's a hypothalamus issue, it's going to affect the pituitary. It trickles down. <clears throat> but my, my, my point is, so let's say, you know, we're having issues losing weight and stuff, and everybody automatically says it's the thyroid, but do they have a test where they test it from the very top? And then, you know, to see maybe it is uh, the hypothalamus or the pituitary before you get to the thyroid. Yep, and we're going to cover that when we get to more of the blood lab, um, okay. the, the blood results section. Mm -hmm. But no, absolutely. You're right, it's a chain of command. It's dominoes. If this isn't working right, this can't. If this isn't working right, everything below it can't work right either. But you're on the right track. And we'll look at that more when we get to the blood test. Good question. Now, I'm, not, I'm certainly hoping that this image doesn't offend anyone. But the thyroid issues typically are more commonly found in the female population than the males. And we've... Two of the issues could be hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism, and there are other issues as well, but we'll, we'll focus on these tonight. Um, so some common symptoms of hypothyroidism are hair loss. Well, it's also in hyperthyroidism. Inability to think clearly. Some people might use the term brain fog. That's a common term as well. Um, both can have an enlarged goiter in the, the uh, thyroid itself. And with hypothyroidism, some people actually notice a reduced heart rate. A real easy way to remember the difference between hypo and hyper is O is slow. There's an O in slow, there's an O in hypothyroidism. Hyper is excessive and fast. So hypo, think of what slows the body down. Well, I'm going to be fatigued. I'm going to have a sensitivity to cold. Skin can be very dry and it's very easy to gain weight. Very hard to lose weight. There's some puffiness. A lot of times the body will hold water and hold edema. Um, memory problems and constipation. The bowels are slow and they're constipated and they're backed up. Irregular cycles, severe PMS, depression, mood swings, as well as joint and muscle pain, which you know a lot of our patients come in because of joint and muscle pain. So many times it could be a chiropractic issue, but it could also be a hormonal as well as a met metabolic issue that we have to determine. And then, of course, high cholesterol. And for the most part, hyper is the opposite. You may have bulging eyes, heart palpitations, tremors, heat intolerance, sleep disturbances, weight loss, shortness of breath, diarrhea, increased appetite, irregular cycles, muscle weakness, sweating, anxiety, and depression and mood swings. Okay? But for tonight, we're going to focus mostly on hypothyroid. Now, the question is, how common is it? Well, the Journal, of Medical Medi the Journal of the American Medical Association back in February of 2000 had a study that was conducted in Colorado where they tested 25,000 people with a very simple questionnaire and a very simple blood spot test, just a finger prick and some blood. And what they found was that 10% of the people studied had an undiagnosed abnormal functioning thyroid. So there's 25,000 people who partook in this survey who didn't think they had anything wrong with them it turns out that more than 10% had some type of thyroid issue. According to this, the study, the uh, authors for the research study estimated that 13 million nationally may have undiagnosed abnormal thyroid function. That's a lot, considering we have about 319, 320 million people in the United States. This study was limited because, as I said, it was the, the study was limited to a questionnaire and they really only tested TSH and T4 and not the rest of the panel, which we'll get into in just a moment. Now, like I said, my, one of my mentors, one of the guys who I've studied under, Dr. Brownstein, his practice is primarily thyroid. And he's saying that this estimation is low and he thinks that 13 million is way, way, way lower. His estimation would be more like 
50 million. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a lot of people walking around who are sick and either A, don't know it, or B, they are the walking wounded. I call the walking wounded because they've been to this doctor or that doctor, been to the endocrinologist, their internist, they've had, they've been poked and prodded and blood drawn and everything and they're not getting the answers and they just feel like they're not going to get better and sometimes they feel like it's all in their head and they've been told that and unfortunately I feel that there is hope for many of these folks. So, how or why could this be? How could we have all these undiagnosed issues? Well, you have to follow me. Sometimes my analogies go off track. Have you ever seen the CarMax commercial where they say that every car that they come in or buy goes through a 120 point check? Mm -hmm. Have you seen that one? Mm -hmm. Well, let's pretend it's Friday afternoon and it's half an hour before the technician gets to leave for home and he gets a car into his bay and he's supposed to do his 120 point check and he's got a date or he's got plans. He, he wants to get out of there in half an hour. And he's seen this car many, many times before, and he knows that if there's an issue with this car, it's going to be probably one of ten things. So he does kind of an abbreviated evaluation, and he just checks those ten things, finds everything's fine, and gives it an A-OK -okay and passes it on. Well, he might be able to do that once, and he might get away with it, but there were 110 other things that he or she didn't check. But what if that person does that every day with every car and just goes by the statistics of these 10 things are most likely to be the problem and skips 100 plus things? At some point, you're going to miss something, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe the brakes don't work or the radiator's busted or, I don't know, the furnace or the heater or whatever doesn't work. Well, should we treat people like that? No. Well, unfortunately, we have kind of a healthcare system that does. Yeah. And statistically, if this thing isn't wrong, well, I'm not going to dig any deeper and sit there and tell a patient that it's in their head, that's not really very professional or ethical. And why is that a burr in, in my britches? Because that happened to my mom. Some doctor told my mom it was in her head. It was about a different health issue, not her thyroid. But that did not sit well with her and it just kind of didn't sit well with me. I don't think we should treat people like that. And unfortunately, if you do go to your primary or your internist and you ask to have a thyroid test done, they're probably going to do two, maybe three tests. One is TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone, which comes from the, the pituitary, and then free T4, which comes from the thyroid. Sometimes they'll do a T3, which is actually the active form. T4 is more of the inactive form, um, but very rarely will they go any further. And how does this have anything to do with CarMax? Well, let's, let's go further. I definitely agree that TSH and the T4 should be evaluated, but the T3 should also be checked as well because the T3 is the active form that actually tell, gets into the cells to communicate and do its job and keep that, energy, that engine running. But there's also the total T4 and total T3 and three, T3 uptake and the free thyroxine index and the reverse T3 and the thyroid peroxidase antibodies and the thyroglobulin binding antibodies. So that's 10. That's two. If I only do two out of 10, at some point I'm probably going to miss something with the person, right? And please, I'm not here to you know, besmirch or speak badly of any other physician, but statistically, if you're only checking two out of 10 things, you're going to miss something at some point. In fact, we had a, a young lady in her mid-30s um, not too long ago come in and fatigue and other similar thyroid type of symptoms. And same story, since college, which was about 10 years ago, had been getting her blood test done every year, every other year, and everything was quote normal. But she decided to try an alternative approach, and we ran the full panel. And it turned out that these last two um, were high, and typically in that case, we're looking at a person who's moving towards autoimmune disease, in particular more like Hashimoto's. And there were a couple other things that we looked at, her ferritin, her iron, and a few other things like her vitamin D and whatnot. And make a long story short, she got on our program, cleaned up some, did some nutraceuticals, did some supplements, changed her diet, and I actually didn't recognize her when she came back in. She had lost so much weight. I can usually see who's in the reception room, who I got coming next, I'm like, 
I didn't recognize that person because she had dropped like 20 plus pounds. But one day, after she came in, um, after she had gone through most of the program, she called back to the office because she wanted a copy of all of her records. I don't think you were working at the front desk yet. I don't think so. Um, and she was a little irritated. And my assistant told me, hey, so-and-so called and she's kind of upset. I'm like, she wants to see me? She's like, yeah. Okay. Um, so she came in for a quick consult. Turns out she wasn't mad at me. She had had her records for the past 10 years since she was in college. And the things that I had pointed out on her current blood work were on the blood work from the past 10 years. It's just that nobody had ever mentioned that or investigated fur further into it. And she was pissed because she had felt like crud for 10 plus years, had difficulty conceiving as a you know woman in her late 20s and early 30s. And I was just happy it wasn't me she was mad at because she was kind of <laughs> irritated. Um, so it's just a matter of looking a little bit deeper, okay? All right, now, but doc, if I do have issues with my thyroid, what will my medical doctor do? Well, the most common type of medications are typically uh, synthetic T4. You may recognize names like Synthroid, Levoxyl, Level Thyroid, um, Triostat, different things like that. And T4, again, is the inactive form that needs to be converted to the active form. Um, now, some may even recognize, or you may even remember, remember people talking about armor thyroid. Remember? Or no? I'm sorry. I guess they do they do thyroid medications with dogs? Mm -hmm. Do they? What do they do with animals? It's um. I'm putting her on the spot. I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. It's um. Thyroid tabs now, FDA approved. Okay. Are they? Are they natural T3 or are they, are they T4? Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay. So Armour was really, really successful in helping people with thyroid problems because it was an actual natural active glandular um, T3. The problem is, is that it's becoming less and less used. I think it's mostly because pharmaceutical companies are having a hard time getting natural thyroid. Maybe they don't make as much money. But for the most part, nowadays, synthetic T4 are being recommended. Well, it's synthetic, and we got to go through a little physiology to understand why this could become a problem. Okay, so let's say we have T4. T4 is the inactive form that was made by the thyroid, and in order to be functional inside the cell, it has to be converted to T3. All right, where can that happen? Well, it can happen in the liver happen in the guts, can happen in the kidneys, different places in the body. But for tonight, we'll kind of focus on these. It's, there are other locations. So, and not to get too technical, but there's different enzymes that convert four into three. Deionase one, deionase two, deionase three. Anyway, there's a conversion that happens here to make it an active T3 into our little engine, okay? That little engine gets circulated into the blood and into the body, and it's looking for a cell and we're looking for a receptor site on that cell. Now, a receptor site is kind of like a parking space at the mall. I made the mistake of ordering something online and having it shipped to the store for free shipping. I'm thinking free shipping is good, right? And so I went to the mall on Friday afternoon, like everybody else. That was not a smart move. And I'm driving up and down the rows looking for a parking spot. And you know when you think you see an open spot, you're like, and you get up it's there, a it's, a, it's a motorcycle <laughs> or a damn Mini Cooper. Like, why are those things there? And you're like, ah, oh. and you gotta drive around and you gotta keep looking. So the uh, T3 hormone keeps putzing around until it finds a receptor site in the cell and another one and another one and another one until sometimes there's an imposter and that hormone can't get to the receptor site to get into the cell. And the purpose of that is so that the cell, the engine can get into the cell and, and do its meta control the metabolism for the cell. Now, normally, if those receptor sites are full, let's say we have a healthy person, healthy cell, receptor sites are full, that T3 will actually go back into the circulation as a reverse T3, which sends a signal back to the hypothalamus, the brain, that says, it's all full, it's all good, you can stop making the hormones because it's all of the parking lot spots are full. 
normally, which is also a good reason why to check the reverse T3 even on a healthy person because your TSH and your T4 can be fine, but if there's too much getting kicked out, it's your body's way of saying something's not right. There's too many imposters. Am I making sense so far? Yeah. Because mm -hmm. if I lose you, ask me to repeat. Mm -hmm. All right, so too many imposters, the T3 goes into reverse T3, that can be a problem and that can be found on the blood tests. Okay? How, I, I, how, how do you get, how are the imposters, you know, how do they come about? Okay, so iodine is actually what makes up that T4 and that T3. So iodine is what actually is connected to that receptor site. Uh -huh. And iodine is part of the family of halides. And it has cousins. It has chloride as a cousin has bromide as a cousin, has fluoride as a cousin. Some of those words probably sound familiar, right? Oh, yeah. They're all halides. They're very similar. My cousins and I look similar, but we're not the same. And the problem is that they look so similar that they fit into this receptor site. They don't go into the cell. They don't let the engine do its thing. They actually block entrance, and then the T3 gets kicked back up. So it looks the same, but it's not. And unfortunately, these are things, these are chemicals that we are surrounded with in our society and our, and our lifestyle. And we'll get into that more in just two seconds, but good question. Now, there are other toxins like triclosan, which is an antibacterial agent. It's chlorinated, we recognize that word, right? It has chlorinated base. It's an organic molecule that's similar to bisphenol A. Maybe you've heard of BPA-free bottles or BPA free plastics. Moms are looking for, you know, baby bottles that don't have BPA in because it's a toxin that gets into the body. The problem is it's also found in household products like toothpaste and mouthwash and deodorant and soap and shaving cream and cleaning supplies and cooking cooking utensils and trash bags and clothing and the list went so on I just had to stop. It's everywhere. And well where do we find these chemicals? Well we find them in everything. Anybody here drink Mountain Dew? No. <laughs> I don't. Okay. <laughs> Mountain Dew is, is brominated soda. Okay. Um, anybody brush their teeth? Fluoridated teeth? Uh, toothpaste? Yeah. The problem is with fluoride is it's in our teeth for such a short period of time, we actually end up swallowing more of it than actually using it for our teeth. And we also have fluoridated water. Fluorine is actually a neurotoxin. Actually, it was found in an Italian court that it was labeled as a neurotoxin. And I love my dentist friends, and I'm not saying anything bad about them, but we're actually starting to see connections between Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, dementia, and other neurological issues from fluorine and other heavy metals and toxins. Um, so the, the uh, triclosane and those other chemicals are in shampoo, they're in conditioner, and they're also in deodorant. Do you know that in Australia, they don't let their companies put aluminum in the deodorant that they sell to their people, but yet here in America they do. It gets absorbed through the skin, and now we have a heavy metal toxin in our body. So we are literally living and swimming in a sea of chemicals. Okay, well, what can we do? Well, okay, what does this mean? So not only can there be imposters that block the receptor sites, but we also have to rely on the other organ systems. Remember how I said the thyroid doesn't work by itself? It needs those other organ systems to convert the hormone? Well, when we, we need to look at inflammatory markers. If there's inflammation in the body, that's gonna affect how the body converts T4 to three. We need to look at the liver and the gut function. We have a very unhealthy diet in our culture, and unfortunately those organs suffer, and therefore they can't do their job very well of converting the hormone. And we have to look at the blood sugar and all that good stuff as well, which the point being is nothing works isolated by itself. So to sit there and say this one blood test or the, these two tests on this blood sample shows everything's fine when you have a patient who's overweight, fatigued, tired, has poor memory, and just has other issues going on, to sit and say, well, your blood tests are fine, it's in your head. We really have to kind of move away from looking at just the lab and looking at the person. Say, well, obviously they're there for a reason. I don't know too many people who like to go to the doctors just for the heck of it. They're there because something brought them there. Okay, 
Now, you had mentioned earlier a question about the pituitary. Um, I have so many slides. We don't have, I, I wish I had 12 hours to go over this stuff with you. Uh, but not only the pituitary can become an issue, but if, let's say the thyroid is actually well, and all the other tests are fine, there could be other reasons for the fatigue, like the adrenal fatigues or uh, run-down adrenals. Does anybody not know what the adrenals are? So the adrenals are little glands that sit on top of your kidneys. They look they like look a stocking cap. You got little kidneys that look like little beans. They have like a little stocking cap. And you remember the Energizer Bunny commercials? And they kept going and going and going. That's supposed to be your adrenals. And so even if the fire is working correctly, the adrenals could just be burned out from stress, from similar issues with chemicals and, and what have you. And unfortunately, that's really a conversation for another day. But yes, it could be the pituitary, it could be the adrenals, it could be anywhere in that endocrine system that's not working correctly. But how is a functional doctor, a functional approach different than conventional? So I kind of have to lay some math groundwork here. So let's say you went to the lab and you got some blood drawn. And these are made up numbers. This doesn't connect to anything right now. But let's say on a scale of zero to 100, the lab takes a bunch of samples from 1,000, 2,000 people and they look at the averages, all right? And our average and our median would be 50 right here. What they usually do, their clinical acceptable range is usually two standard deviations above and two below. So two above 50 would be 70, two below 50 would be 30. So if whatever we were testing fell between 30 and 70, we would be within the accepted normal range. Here's the problem. Here's a bell curve. These are the really super healthy people, okay? So if we go two standard deviations above that, they're not so healthy, are they? They've kind of mm -hmm. fallen down, right? Mm -hmm. Or if it's below, they've really fallen far from the top. I prefer functional doctors look more at optimal or ideal ranges, and we only go one standard deviation above, one standard deviation below. So let's say I'm at 60, well, I'm in a much better position than the person who's at 69, right? Or if I'm at 40, I'm in a much better position than the person who's at 31 or 32. Are you, am I making sense? Yeah. Okay, good. But let's apply this to something more useful. I'm going to go off onto a tangent. I want to talk about vitamin D because the numbers are easy math. If you go to your lab and get drawn, they're looking for your vitamin D to be between 30 and 100. That's a really wide range. That's huge. All right? Current research is really indicating that you would like the ideal range to be between 70 and 90, okay? So you'd notice I have green light, I have yellow light, and I have red light. We really want things to be in the green light. Time and time and time again, I have people who come in, oh yeah, my doctor tested my vitamin D. I'm like, well, let me look at your, let me look at your labs. Let me look at your numbers. Oh yeah, I'm fine, I'm fine. They come in at 32 or 35 and they think that they're fine. So I kind of have to tell them that Santa Claus isn't real, and the Easter Bunny is only a story, and your numbers aren't right. And if, you, if your MD is telling you that your numbers are good, and they're this off, we need to really look at the rest of your labs as well. So let's apply this to the thyroid. So we have CSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone. Clinical norms would be between 0.1 and 5.5. Again, a very big range. Ideally, an optimal range would be between 0.3 and 3. In fact, this is changing because a lot of the, I go to a lot of seminars, like, like once a, a lot. month. What's that? A lot. A lot. <laughs> um, the current research is showing we really want this to be under 2, closer to 1. Wow. Okay. So even narrower? Even more narrow, yeah. You have to remember, these averages come from a sick population. So we were, were overweight, we, we aren't healthy. So the sicker a population is, oh, the, the more, more normal is, those are gonna look then because you're looking at a, a sample that's of, of sick people. Exactly, exactly. But is anybody healthy in the US of A? <laughs> no, I'm not serious. Really, not really. I mean, we've got a lot of overweight people. So yeah, those are really skewed, which what they should do is they should be going outside of the US of A and going to healthier countries. Well, isn't it interesting that Europe won't accept our corn and our GMO crops? Mm -hmm. South America. I don't blame them. 
All South America is for profit. That's it. Russia wouldn't even accept our coin. And that's bad if Russia doesn't. I mean, if Russia won't accept it, that's not so good. So the point being is, when, first of all, when somebody says, well, doc, my labs are normal, they're usually only testing two, maybe three. Right. Okay. Um, and even if they were, are they within the optimal range or are they in the clinical range? So you kind of have to dig deeper, right? Okay. Another difference is that the medical approach is usually chasing after symptoms and conditions. Anything from acne to sinusitis to hay fever to flu to colds, ulcers. The, the leaves of the tree are many, and you can go crazy chasing after those things. We really want to look at more of the root underlying cause. Everything connects to a body system, and then it goes back to the terrain. Either a mental or emotional stress, a nutritional deficiency, physical trauma, or toxic overload. We really have to look at the constitution of the person. And instead of chasing symptoms, we want to look at more of the underlying cause. Maybe a better way of looking at it is, if we address the immune imbalances, the structural imbalances, the inflammatory or hormonal imbalances, dealing with toxic chemical exposure, digestive issues, as well as mitochondrial dysfunction, if we look at the roots and address what's here, doesn't the tree heal itself? Well, usually. All right. So, what minerals and vitamins, or what minerals and vitamins would the thyroid normally need? Things like vitamin A, B12, D, and E. And again, like we said, just on our other previous example, we want to go to all of them. But just with vitamin D, if you're not getting enough D, even if you have normal thyroid hormone, your thyroid isn't going to function as well as it's supposed to. And of course, zinc, selenium, iron, copper, DHEA, pregnenolone, which are cholesterol and fat, and iodine. All right. You can tell I love cartoons because I just connect with them better. But let's focus more on the gut as far as converting T4 and T3. We said the liver, the gut, the adrenals, all that. The thyroid controls the gut. Well, if there's an issue with the gut, can it precipitate to an issue with the thyroid? Well, the gut kind of feeds everything else. So if there's an issue with the gut, we might have issues with our adrenals, our joints, our sinuses, our mouth, our brain, of course the thyroid and the colon and whatnot. And one of the terms that I use a lot in my office is leaky gut. Anybody familiar with what that term is? Can anyone describe that for me? Um, you sound like you have an idea. <laughs> Uh, okay, this is this is what I think it is. Um, your your function, your your gut is not functioning correctly, so you're not what you're putting into your system. You're not getting out of your system. Okay. I mean, um, what do you got? You're on the right track. Yeah. Okay. You're on the right track. Um, you're gonna have to go from here. All right, <laughs> let's pretend the gut is a screen on a window. Uh -huh. And during nicer climate, we can have the window open and we can have fresh air coming in, but a screen does what? It keeps mosquitoes out mm -hmm. and leaves and bugs and spiders, right? But let's say I took a pen or a screwdriver and started punching holes in the screen. One or two holes isn't gonna be a big deal, right? Mm -hmm. But if I do a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth, Eventually, there's not going to be much screen, and the mosquitoes are going to get in, and I don't like mosquitoes and spiders. So the more toxic our environment, the more toxic our guts become, the more holes and the more permeability that happens in the gut. Okay? So I think the term you're looking for is intestinal permeability. Um, this you is, mean all that stuff is just spewing out in your body? It's getting into your body. I like to use the analogy of the castle wall. And I, this works for your immune system as well as it works for your gut. Let's pretend we have strong castle walls. We could have 100,000 barbarians outside of our castle walls. Doesn't matter. We've got good, strong castle walls. They're not going to get in. But let's say there's cracks and there's holes some, anywhere around that wall. It's not going to take 10,000 barbarians. All you need is 10 sneaky little ninjas to sneak in there and, and kidnap the damsel in distress and kill the king, right? So the more holes, the more intestinal permeability, the more toxins, the more inflammation, it starts to break down that screen, that wall, and that's when things like food allergies and intolerances start to develop 
immune system abnormalities, and of course, autoimmune issues. So the more holes in our screen or our capsule wall, the more bad things can get in there. You're on the right track, just words were avoiding you at that moment, okay? And this leads back to inflammation. And there are different sources. Of course, it can be nutritional and food from the foods and things that we eat. It can be physical stress. It can be emotional. Yes, emotions can cause inflammation. I think our culture still is poo-pooing too much of the mental and the emotional factor when it comes to the internal health. I think some of us are starting to get it. Maybe not quite where we need to be yet. But inflammation in the body is like a house on fire. There's a difference between me burning um, a fillet on the stove and the kitchen catching on oh, not yet. Um, the kitchen catching on fire and the whole building catching on fire. There's different levels of inflammation. Same thing with the body. Um, but what can we do right now? Well, you can give yourself a little two-week challenge. Over the next two weeks, which is going to be hard because it's Christmas, get rid of foods that cause inflammation. Things like um, carbohydrates, things that are processed. I know, alcohol and caffeine. I know there's some coffee lovers here. Come on. Oh, yeah. Um, alcohol, um, caffeine, pork, cold cuts, bacons, hot dogs, canned meat, sausage, shellfish. Why are those bad? Those tend to be higher in arachidonic acid. And arachidonic acid is one of those things that's in our food that promotes inflammation. There are things that are anti inflammatory, there are things that are pro inflammatory. And that happens to be one of those foods that adds more gasoline to a fire. Corn and tomatoes. Well, Doc, I thought those were healthy. Most of our corn and tomatoes nowadays are GMO, genetically modified. And our guts haven't changed in the last 10,000 years to really process them very well. And that can promote more of that inflammation inside the gut. Dairy. Now, the things that we do to those cows, we pump them with hormones, we pump them with antibiotics, we pump them with steroids and that gets carried over to the milk, which then, if we drink, gets into us, or if we eat Ben and Jerry's, gets into us, or if we have, oh, but Doc, yogurt's so healthy for me. It still came from a source that was contaminated. Foods that are high in fats, oils, including peanuts, refined oils, margins, and shortenings. And basically, real simple, man made it, refined it, tampered with it, don't eat it. But if God made it, or nature made it, it's probably the best natural way to go. So that's just something you can do for yourself over the next two weeks. Or if you can't do it now, wait for January 2nd. And I think you might notice a difference. With you. Well, look at that. My house is on fire today, just today alone. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know, the interesting thing is, is we've had people who have eliminated these things. Dairy, um, caffeine, um, cake, pastas, things like that. And then they come back a couple, two, three weeks later and they say, hey, I was doing really well, but then I went to a party and I had a piece of cake, or I, I had this or I had that. And they come in and they're like, I can feel the difference. I'm like, yeah, you can. I don't have to shake my finger at anybody. It's like, your body told you, don't do that anymore. Um, but try to incorporate more of these. <laughs> I mean, the list goes on. Green leafy vegetables, cucumbers, bok choy, celery, blueberries, very rich in antioxidants, walnuts, flax seeds. Basically, don't shop on the shop around the perimeter of the grocery store where the, the produce is. And try to avoid the middle stuff where it's boxed and refined and processed. Um, broccoli, kale, black beans, those help. I put tomatoes up there, but if you can find an organic, uh, like organic avocado, if you can find an organic source, then go for it. Um, but sometimes even with making those changes, people need a deeper investigation. Our nutritional evaluation is comprised of really three different disciplines or three different parts. We definitely work with whatever blood work or labs a person has already had, and we look at if they're within that clinical range or if they're within that functional optimal range. We want to know where they're at. Sometimes we have to order more tests because they haven't been done like they should. We do a NutriQ questionnaire, um, which if you're interested at the end of the night, we'll have you just tell Lexi. Um, Give us your email address, and we'll send you the NutriQ questionnaire, which we'll, we'll go over the results here in a second. But it's a 322 questionnaire that digs deep into what could be going on with your body and kind of gives us a direction of where we need to go. 
And then I also do a muscle testing technique called contact reflex analysis. So let me kind of explain here. So again, love the cartoons. The red circles are your red blood cells, the white circles are your white blood cells, and the brown circles are donuts. We need to talk. <coughs> oh, come on, that was fine. <laughs> All right, I'll work on the jokes. So, <coughs> so don't quit the your thing, you know? <laughs> so, and what was that thing you just found? The coffee thing? The Dunkin' a what? Oh, Dunkin' Chino. Dunkin' Chino. Oh, oh, I'm getting one tomorrow. <laughs> It does in donuts? Yeah. Oh. It's got it's hot chocolate and coffee in it. It's uh, like that. Amazing. Um, so let's say we're Sounded back amazing. to talking. <coughs> so we're back to talking about thyroid. So of course we'd want to do a complete thyroid panel. We'd also want to look at the adrenals because they could be burned out. Because if the thyroid goes down, <coughs> it's a reverse relationship. If the thyroid isn't doing its job, the adrenals have to do their job more to keep the body energy and metabolism up. So the longer the thyroid is down, the more the adrenals have to work, and eventually they get tired and they get burned out as well. And the thing about adrenal fatigue is there's, there's still a lot of people in the medical profession who don't want to acknowledge that adrenal fatigue is a real thing. It's okay, they didn't want to believe fibromyalgia was a real thing either until there's so many sick people that you can't not deny it anymore. Um, so the adrenals definitely have to be looked at as well as well as inflammatory markers like the ESR and CRP and fibrinogen and mineral and by, whoa, slow down, mineral <laughs> test. Um, we don't want to just chase the symptoms, we want to look at the whole person um, metabolically. This is a report from that NutriQ questionnaire and you'll see that we actually go into detail in 16 different categories from the immune system, the kidney and bladder, the cardiovascular, male, female, the thyroid, pituitary, and adrenal, these are the endocrine areas, vitamin needs, sugar handling, our body's need for essential fatty acids, mineral needs, large and small intestine, as well as liver, gallbladder, and upper GI, so the, the gastrointestinal, the gut. And what we do is it breaks it into high, moderate, and low priority. And anything above, kind of the low, concerns me. This particular gentleman did not do so well. Um, he was, he, many of these markers came in high, in the high category. Um, and a lot of times the, the issue with vitamins and handling sugar and essential fatty acids is because the guts, going back to the leaky gut syndrome, it's not processing the foods that we eat well enough and into small enough parts so we're not necessarily getting good nutrients and into, into the body to be used and metabolized. Um, I have some patients who take you know, doc, I, I googled and I found this supplement for this and I found that vitamin for that. And the problem is there's a lot of crap out on the internet mm -hmm. and you're not necessarily getting a good quality product. But even if you were, if the guts are not working correctly, you're wasting your money, you're wasting your money anyway. And so this individual did not do so hot. So um, contact reflex analysis, the muscle testing part is based on the acupuncture meridians. And here's a little guy with a bunch of dots and lines. And acupuncture works on the energy of the system, of the body. And the best analogy I can come up with is the energy in the walls in this building. I can't see electrons. I can't see the electricity, but I can see the end result, either the lights on or the lights off. I can see the effect, right? Well, if I wanted to run my vacuum cleaner or run my laptop, what do I look for? Well, I look for an outlet to tap into the power in the walls. The brain is like a giant battery and it runs electricity down my nerves to make me contract my muscle, my arm, or to play the piano, or to walk. And anytime there's electricity running through a wire, whether in the wall or through my arm, there's a magnetic field around there. Any electrician can tell you that and show you that. Same thing with the nerves in the body. And so an acupuncture point is nothing different than an outlet that we can tap into if we're doing acupuncture. But in this case, what we do is we actually just touch those points, test the muscle, and if there's a short circuit in that system, maybe the stomach or maybe the ileocecal valve, the muscle will go weak. And that tells me something isn't right, it's not balanced. It doesn't tell me if there's a disease there, but it tells me this system is not optimal functioning and we need to dig deeper, if that makes sense. Okay, so um, like I said, 
Uh, we do a nutritional evaluation here. If you or a family member is interested in having this evaluation done, it's not, oh, boy. All right, it's normally $120, but as a thank you for participation with our, our class, it's only $97 to the end of December 31st. So you go home and tell a family member, hey, there's this really cool thing, this presentation. Um, we will more than, be more than happy to extend that to you as well. Um, it is not covered by insurance, which is usually the next question. Insurance is very behind on functional tests, and they really haven't caught up on that yet. The good news, the bad news is it's not covered by insurance, but the good news is it's not a million bucks. It's only 97. Now, maybe you don't want to dig that deep. Maybe you just want to start with a simple questionnaire. Um, like I said, Alexis would be happy to take your name and email address, and we'll email you that information. You can fill out the questionnaire, and then when we have the report, we can send it to you or even set up a consultation. So what does the nutritional exam consist of? Okay. So it consists of these three things. It consists of, boy, we'll evaluate any blood work that you have or order blood work that you might need. It consists of the questionnaire, and then it consists of the, uh, the muscle testing evaluation. So, so where, who does the blood work? I mean, well, if we send you out to Quest, or that the, the blood work would fall under, it, anything out of the office falls under your insurance or what have you. Anything I do in-house would be on this, this promotion. So if you went to Quest or if you went to LabCorp or wherever you had the blood work done. Okay, so we would be going to, and they would be, you know, somebody like Quest or something, they would do the blood work according to what you're what looking I ordered, for? Right, right. So, um, uh, when you had that list of stuff, the comprehensive, I mean, are they are they going to do all of those? If I put all it on of that? The order, if I put it on the order form, yeah. So, how are you going to know which one to do? You're going to start out with the comprehensive thyroid panel. Was that the thing where you do that, the T4 and the T, and then the active one, you know, the list that you had? Correct. So, how much would something like that cost, you know? That one, that's actually outside of the office. That's with the labs, mm -hmm. um, typically that would be covered under the insurance and you would have to ask them what their fees are, I don't know. Okay. This promotion was really more of what I do in the office. This this is what the, I guess I'm maybe not explaining it well enough, but whatever I do in the office is the $97 promotion. Mm -hmm. um, but if we do have to order other blood work that typically would fall under your insurance and whatever the insurance in the laboratory has arranged. Right, okay. He would order the blood work after you have a you consult. You do the questionnaire? Right. Yeah. Or the, uh, after so you do he has the, a good starting point. Right. Because these things kind of give me an idea of what direction I need to go. Mm -hmm. Based on the questionnaire, based on the muscle testing, many times the blood work that a person has is sufficient. And we can make a game plan from there. Sometimes the blood work is deficient in certain tests and we have to order them and send them out to the lab. Um. Will you take the blood work from my primary physician? Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because yeah. I did have blood work done for thyroid, and I do have a thyroid issue. Okay. Um, and they took, so they put me on medication, which I think didn't do anything for me, and I had really, I got really bad headaches. Mm. So I kind of took myself off of it. Okay. So they did some more blood work, but I don't think they went extensive, like the list you did. Okay. All those, you know, yeah, parts absolutely. And stuff, we, you know? we would be more than happy to take if you've had blood work done recently. We want to look at that. Okay. And many times, like I said, we can get enough information from that to move forward. Okay. But if there is something miss missing, or they didn't do some things, we may have to send you out again to get another. One. But at least we have a starting point. So the places that you can go for blood work, how do we know that they're? So it's what you order. Uh, it's not just um, what they. You know, like they're not gonna like like how you did the car X thing. They're not gonna be missing. You know, you're telling them I want this. Exactly. Done. Exactly. I'm, they, I'm putting on the order form. These are the tests I want done for this individual. So there's a protocol. They have to do whatever you say. They right. have to follow. So it's not like if I go to one place or another place, it's the same test. I mean, it's like if you say if I go to this doctor or this doctor and you say I want this test. Right. Either place is going to be doing the exact same. Correct. Okay. Whether it's LabCorp or Quest or a, a private lab, whatever I put on the order form, 
If I do the full 10 panel, it, if you go to CVS or wherever you go, they should do those those tests that are on the order form. And that's with, that includes this $97 that No, you, that is separate. That's separate, okay. No. Mm -hmm. What I do, I have no control over the labs. I okay, no, 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 I'm saying the test that you want them to do for the patient, um, it comes on under the... No. No, okay, so it's no. separate, okay. What I do in the office falls under... Okay. If I have to send you to a lab core, lab quest, that would fall under whatever deal they had with your insurance okay. Okay. or cash or whatever. Gotcha. What I do in the office, what? Look at your screen. You're switching oh. things. Man, mm -hmm. this is a touchy. He just got it today. This is a new one. So if, if whatever I do, the three things, the things that I do, right, in the office, normally is one hundred twenty dollars, right. But as a thank you, we're knocking it down to ninety seven. Okay. But if there's outside blood work, that falls under. Outside the walls. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. okay. And if you do want to do the evaluation, you're welcome to. That'd be great. We can have you schedule with Alexis tonight before you leave. Mm -hmm. If you don't want to get that deep, if you just want to do a questionnaire and see, hey, where do my numbers fall? That's totally fine too. No charge, complimentary. All we need is your email address. We'll email it to you. And when you fill out the questionnaire, we'll, we'll get that score. And then if you want to dig deeper, you're welcome to. And if you don't want to, that's okay too. So, I mean, let's say for instance you do the blood work and you take a look at it. So, you're analyzing the blood work is what you're doing or the results of it, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and you're going to approach this not in a medical way. You're going to approach this more in a holistic way? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, it's going to be like, yeah, yeah natural, natural, like. Yeah. Supplements and things like that, right? Yes, correct. Okay. okay, okay, that's what I was going. And of course, that's extra, right? Of course, what if you have, if we need something, yeah, and you right. find out something. This is just okay. the evaluation. evaluation. Okay. My first mission is to figure out if I can help you. Okay. If we go through you. this evaluation and I don't think I can help you, then I'm going to tell you and maybe find somebody to refer you to. Okay. But if I do go through this evaluation, term, hey, you've got these issues that we can help you with. Mm -hmm. From there, then we make a game plan of what the next step would be. Okay. okay. The detox program. Like the detox program yeah. that you've done before. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. detox. Yeah. Is it? Maybe I need to do that too. <laughs> well, and we'll figure that out based on.